Come on. This Maximus here, this time with a review of the Black & Decker 1321. The metal labels that are held on with just two rivets, it's really easy for them just to get caught on something, get torn off, which is what appears to have happened for, to this drill. Did only pick it up for 15 bucks. The same as the DeWalt DW131. This is the 6 amp, 450 RPM, triple gear reduction, heavy duty, half inch spade handle drill. Earlier versions like this from the 1980s. We know that because of the Black & Decker Hexagon logo. Pretty common drill, so it's pretty easy to find them on like eBay. Although people charge a lot of money for them now. It's actually really pretty surprising. Uh, I used to find good de tool deals on eBay and it seems like a lot of stuff is just, people want an arm and a leg. The cheapest one on eBay was shipping, which was like 45 or $50. Much, <laughs> then it was pretty beat up, even more beat up than this one. Anyway, the Milwaukee 1660 was the big competition. It was actually the, probably one of the most popular ones. Real close. There are many other manufacturers of this class, which are like spade handle mixing drills. 450 RPM, which is a actually pretty standard low RPM without being too slow, like the 300 RPM on a whole hog. And just built real heavy duty with all ball and needle bearings. And the big difference is these had straight cut gears, or at least in the DeWalt it does. I'm not sure about these earlier ones, where the Milwaukee's always had helical cut gears, so they're a little bit less gear noise. But it's really difficult to really say which one is heavier duty and longer lasting and more durable between this Black and Decker and the accompanying Milwaukee once again. One thing that is obvious is the Black & Decker really was rear in that era was just so good about just rounding off and having kind of elegant tools, just a nicely rounded handle. The Milwaukee always had a more squared off, more uncomfortable handle back in the era when you would use it for mixing, so we do. Whoop. Always have that. I forgot I had it plugged in and give it a run here. Those bearings are running pretty freely. So this has definitely seen some use, but not terribly abused. And it's kind of hard to see between patina and just being beat up around a garage or a barn or a shop. You know, some corrosion on the chuck and actual hours of work. But what we don't see is just a lot of heavy gouging, a lot of getting beat up. Interestingly enough, this was from an era where they were trying to, I guess, electrically insulate the rear handle. Because there's these little plastic washers under the screws and this little plastic... Um, isolator so I thought that was kind of interesting I know it hasn't been that well worked it has the original power cord there's actually isn't any fraying right here which would happen real quickly and no fraying right here actually pretty decent strain relief and one thing I always appreciated about these was the fact that they just use a traditional just a heavy-duty toggle switch that's a standardized uh, electrical component so if the reverse switch ever went out you can just get one from an electrical store. Or actually, I think even quite a few hardware stores sell just basic metal toggle switches like that. And then you just have a, a pretty standardized trigger that was shared with many heavy-duty power tools of that era. And so it was pretty easy just to find a replacement trigger and reverse switch since they weren't actually integrated into each other. Gave you a little bit of an extra riser on the handle too. And as you can see, it runs and glides real nice. Earlier versions had half-inch thread spindles. Later versions, like the DeWalt, they moved up to 5 eighths just because a little bit of issues with, you know, using big, heavier-duty bits and spindles getting bent. This one's pretty straight. A lot of corrosion on the truck from basically humidity um, and condensation. Well, Jacob's chucks, you can usually just really hose them down. Just put a bunch of oil all around the teeth, all around the edge of the collar so it all soaks in. And you can get Jacob's chucks to really just come right back to life. One of the reasons for that is high alloy steels 
uh, just don't rust quite as severely as low alloy. Uh, just a basic carbon steel 1018. When that stuff rusts, it just really layers up and cakes on to just impossible levels. Or with hardened alloy steels, you get some pretty severe rust, but uh, it just doesn't get quite as thick or quite as caustic as on milder steels. Anyway, that's kind of the deal with these. You know, whenever you get one of these drills, you know, besides lubing up the chuck, checking the brushes, you want to put some new grease in the gearbox, and you'll last another 20 years. Big deal is, is the bearing at the back of the motor only has a tiny amount of grease that came inside the bearing, and those always seem to dry up. And so those are the ones you want to definitely replace. I always kind of like these old Black & Deckers because they have this steel cover right here, which just allows you easy access to, one, both pop out the motor. It makes it a lot easier for servicing. But just to be able to access the commutator, maybe, you know, kind of a throwback from an older era. We'll open this up first. I don't mind the slot head screws. You, you just need one screwdriver to service the whole darn tool. Anyway, you have this real nice cover here. You can pop that off and you just have free access. You can get nice close inspection. We can see that, well, maybe if I zoomed in some here. There's some zoom. See a nice wrapped field, but they didn't do too much protection on the armature. And we can see folded contacts. I was on Black & Decker's heavy duty drill back in the 80s. So they've been doing that for a long time. But it would have been nicer just to see a little bit more protection on the motor. The reason field windings aren't wrapped anymore is simply because, uh, one, it's just a little bit more expensive. Two, it has proven to really not be as necessary as thought. They're just fields tend not to fail through physical damage, but more through burning out from overheating. So they've actually been, uh, that wrapping does insulate and make the field get a little bit hotter. And those are the reasons they really just don't do that anymore. Even though this is a six amp, has a real heavy duty commutator, more on lines with like a 10 amp tool, heavy duty brushes. We can see this has a fair amount of wear, but if I run my finger across, there's barely any lip. So this thing was used, but not a terrific amount. And then of course, since this bearing gets a little bit stuck, it's pretty easy once you have that open just to be able to pry against it and pop out the motor. Plus, it's nice and open, so if you want to run, use like one of these brush seeder and commutator cleaners, real easy to get access to it. And it's actually, this is one of the tools that can be used both manually, like you putting the end of the armature in a drill and spinning it, or when the machine is active and just carefully rubbing the stick against the commutator just cleans it right up. We'll go ahead and pop out these brushes. One thing that's important, and actually many instruction manuals for tools, uh, at least from the older days, really emphasize the fact that you want to make sure that when you pull out brushes that they go in the same orientation because they have a, they wear a certain way with the direction that the motor primarily spins. That's why a lot of brush tools, when you run them in reverse, they have a funny sound because it's actually running the commutator or running the motor backwards against the standard wear. So they always tell you to make sure that you have um, that you put them in in the same orientation. Now the thing to remember is Black & Decker really sold a lot of these back in the I guess 40s, 50s, 60s but a lot of drills of this style and people maybe get excited because they see the Black and De old Black & Decker Red Wing logo but most of those even though they're they average they're so early they were 3.5 amps and uh, 400 RPM moving up to like 4 amps and 450 RPM, but they always said standard duty. And so they had sleeve bearings where this has needle bearings. You can see both the through holes and you can see the little cups where they have like a little ridge. It's telltale sign of a needle bearing. So you do have to watch out for the standard duty ones because they tend to have, they are essentially about half the power of one of these heavy duty versions. And so it's just another option when somebody wants just an old or a just a nice all around mixing drill. I mean, Milwaukee still makes these or makes the 1660 Super Hole Shooters. 
but it's just not as common a drill now. Although still certainly as valid as ever. I mean, using battery power tools to do things like mixing really just wastes a heck of a lot of energy. Now, we gotta try to get the diaphragm wants to come off, but, or <laughs> the two parts of the gearbox are kind of stuck together. I wonder if, usually you just give it some taps and probably have to get a rubber hammer if this tapping with that bit doesn't work. Actually, it is. It just gonna take a minute to work this gear gear case apart finally got that gearbox apart that was just what got 35 40 years of grease just being hardened actually was like an adhesive there was no gasket or anything in there just a, a pretty well machined surface machined well enough where as soon as a little bit of grit got in there actually not even grit as soon as a little bit of the grease hardened up it actually self-sealed where it is so same as the Walt, they do use straight cut gears those are pretty wide that's like a half inch gear we have a really large needle bearing to really help it to help uh, stabilize that spindle and what I really like about a lot of these classic drills is you can see that those aren't spaced or caged needle well uh, space is the right word many needle bearings it's there's a little guide in there, so there's a where here we have just a bunch of needles all stacked up. They'll skip them and have like a little guide in there, and it makes it a little bit cheaper. But these older ones, it's just a huge pile of needles, which of course gives you more load bearing capacity. Quite a bit of grease in there. Take a look at the motor section here. Get these greasy gears out of here. And those are also simply straight cut gears. We do have a couple of just, uh, they're, they're not really thrust washers. They're straight cut. So there's no, not forces m making them go back and forth. That's more just to uh, keep them centered and aligned in the middle of the gearbox. And so those are just washers that you don't want to lose when you're rebuilding this. Otherwise, it'll change the gear alignment. One there. And another one here. Pretty nicely machined gears. We can see the teeth on these gears are... Oh, you can't see very well. My lighting sucks. But you can see there that, like, on this the smaller portion of the reduction gears is where there's going to be more load. So that's the, the teeth... It's not going to be these teeth. There's just so many of them uh, for the wear to be distributed across where so there's going to be less. And so here you just want to take a look and see how um, really how worn they look. To tell you the truth, clean them up a little bit. So there's a greasy gear. And you can still see the flat on the top of the tooth doesn't really look like there's very much wear at all and one of the reasons to have multiple gears in a gearbox is not only it makes it a little bit more compact for a given reduction ratio like if this is a 10,000 rpm motor and getting 450 rpm out you could do it through a single reduction but you have one the little gear on the motor and then a big old gear for the spindle so it allows you to make it more compact second thing is is now instead of all the load just being on one little, or in this case, it's actually pretty big, but on one motor spindle, the load is now transferred to this, the teeth on this gear and the teeth on this gear to get the final drive out. And that distributes load over more steel and more area and allows, so more gears is noisier, but it actually allows under a given load conditions for a gearbox to last longer. Using these calipers, so we got about a half inch spindle on the motor, which is actually pretty large. A lot of tool manufacturers make these little spindles really small to get better ratios out of the motor um, and spend less money on the size of reduction gears. But it's just, of course, doesn't last as long as having just a nice big 
spindle like that with just a whole bunch of teeth. This thing's still kind of heavy even without the gearbox on it. Anyway, once again, nothing but needles. This one for the spindle is really cool. It's a big half inch all needle bearing. There's probably 25, 30 needles in there. So definitely the heavy duty version. Big cavity in there so we could definitely can hold plenty of grease. Big ball bearing there at the front. And since I got to grease the back bearing, shouldn't be too much of an issue just to pop it out here. And you do have to be careful. Make sure you have the brushes removed. And usually it does just... It's not a hard press fit or anything, but it's... Uh, a tight fit and just a little bit of prying. Sometimes if there's any corrosion in there because it is steel and aluminum bore, they can really, really can get pretty stuck. And here's our little commutator or our, excuse me, our uh, armature. They just use little brass inserts, non-magnetic brass inserts for the balancing. So instead of grinding, and actually, talk about the quality of this motor. Look at this. The only balance this motor has is one little piece of brass that's, I don't know, five, five millimeters long by maybe one and a half by one millimeters. I mean, that's a pretty small piece of brass. And it's actually pretty nice to see a motor that has almost <laughs> no balancing. What that means is that this motor may have been built on a Wednesday because uh, just the way the wires and everything worked out on this thing, uh, it came out of the factory uh, almost or out of being wound almost perfectly balanced, which is pretty cool. Do you like seeing the traditional steel fan? And this is actually an extra wide. This is known as a deep groove ball bearing. Anyway, what I do is I just put a little bit of grease in the bore and when I push this back I clean the back of this all up clean out the bore really good and when I push it in it will force some grease since this is a steel shielded this when people when there are steel shields on bearings those are not seals they actually don't make physical contact with the center portion of the bearing and steel shielded bearings are actually seen in many situations where there's extra high speeds where they don't want to spend money on like uh, Teflon seals which can handle you know very high speed bearings plus they're a little cheaper but there is a little gap and they don't physically touch so they don't actually provide a seal so when i put grease in there it just forces its way past through there run it for a second some will kind of come out the front side i can feel that this bearing isn't there's no chunkiness it's a little stiff i can feel that it could use some new grease so that's what i'm going to do now get this back together and do a little test drill You don't want to put too much grease in the gearbox because it will churn over in the gears, start getting really hot. One, the gearbox gets pretty hot um, and it causes expansion. It'll really seep out or it'll push through like the motor bearing and then get spun out by the fan and make a big mess. But you don't have to be uh, afraid. This is actually what I consider the average amount of grease. And what I've put in here is about what Milwaukee, that's one of the things Milwaukee did about a lot of their old tools that actually helped them was that they put in a lot of grease. It was added more expense and added more weight, but just having a higher quantity of grease and the way grease works is it's actually a solution that has oil, liquid oil emulsified in it and it slowly seeps out over time. And that's how it provides lubrication over time. It's a timed release, just like a time release medicine. This is grease time releases oils. And the more that you have, the longer it can do that. So this isn't as dense as it looks because I just I have this little nozzle for my grease gun. And so that's actually more of a spaghetti with a bunch of air in it, as opposed to being a solid, like, handful glob of grease. And no, I didn't clean out the old grease, but it's actually not that bad. Pretty high quality grease. And the last thing I forgot to mention is there's a machine lip that fits into this, these machine bosses here. What that does is even though it's a 2D surface, there's three, diff three degrees of alignment. We have X-axis, Y-axis, and then we have A, or rotational axis, or axis. 
So this machine lip locates it in the center this way and in the center this way. But the way these posted the gears, if it needs to be twisted in exactly the right position. There's a lot of drills that don't have alignment pegs. When you take them apart and put them back together, the gearbox and shift left to right causes the gears to cockeye. And when they cockeye, it causes a lot of pressure on one edge of the gear. Excessive pressure, that starts to wear really quickly because it's not even pressure and can cause the whole set of gears to wear out 10 times faster. So when you have these little alignment pegs, like right here, which fits into this little hole, that keeps the twist or the rotation exactly the same. So when you pull off the gearbox and you put it back on, because of these machine surfaces in the pin, the gears are in the exact same alignment. And so that's important for serviceability because it ensures that the gears are go back the same way that they came out. All right, so here is a generally not recommended scenario, which would be a pretty stout 450 RPM, half inch heavy duty drill with a pretty stout six amp motor, two and nine sixteenths plan tour or plane tour bit. These are notorious. They're not made anymore because they would jam so much, but they are. They are the bee's knees. They're like just a super heavy duty spade bit. Real sharp angle. You can see those wings. They do like to get stuck really easily. But they can just be resharpened quickly and really chew through the material. So, if I have too many issues here, I will, of course, I'm going to brace the drill. You, I did put on a long top handle. Brace the piece of wood and see how we do. That's actually pretty dull. Let me find a different bit. Well, you know a bit is well used. Those used to be flat sides. This has been used so much. So what drill truck teeth have done to the shaft of this bit. Try this again. Obviously I have a long stem in here now because that's what I had. Easy access. Or e where I was able to easily access. <laughs> bogging down a little bit but uh i don't know we got it jammed plantor bits are much faster than self-feed bits are actually one of the most productive bits you can use for large hole making but you can hear when it came through i mean it really wants to lock up and i'm glad i had the piece of wood brace between two feet long handle to brace the drill and because of the way it's sh the disadvantage, and I have to spend a minute getting this out, is one, it splinters the wood so badly on the opposite side that the bit likes to get kind of jammed up, put it in reverse. <laughs> anyway, you can hear it was getting loaded up, but it had no problem, and that was exactly the kind of operation that this drill was meant for and these types of drills are meant to be loaded to about 30 35 percent and milwaukee used to do it and actually a lot of drill manufacturers in the 50s and even 60s and then they stopped what they put on the label is the no load rpm the 450 rpm but they also put in a full load rpm which in this case would be like 300 and so that's what it's designed to, is to be bogged all the way down to 300 RPM and still operate continuously under those kind of conditions. But nonetheless, really is a pretty stout drill. So as you saw, massive productivity out of a uh, nice drill like this with the plantor. 
But people complain about self-feed bits and them leaving rough exit holes. This was the, besides just wanting to jam up so badly, this is why. Those two wings, when they start getting close to the edge of the wood, all that pressure that's just on, I mean, a self-feed bit uses these teeth to cut around the circumference first. And then these blades, which are actually called chip lifters, just carve out the little section that these teeth have essentially pre-hole sawed. These teeth are just slightly higher than the big cutting blade. This just has the cutting blades with no extra teeth. So when it gets to the thin part, since you're putting force on it, it just gets to a point where it punches through. And that, you know, we're wondering why the bit was jammed because it actually just makes a slot on the exit and you still have to like, I mean, you don't want to come in there with the bit again to try to knock it out with the bit. I mean, you got to get in there with a chisel and knock out these other pieces. And uh, it tends to be annoying after a while. And so because of jamming and because of um, the roughest exit, hole po exit holes possible, self-feed bits have since replace them but plantors really always have a place in tool history you can barely make it they have really light stamping on them anyway this video isn't about the bits it was about this black and decker drill and even though it has straight cut gears they're pretty nice pretty well made really finely ground gears and you can hear that they just sounded just fine they were just Happy as a clam doing, uh, being loaded up like that, really tight. If we check the backlash, how much the spindle wants to rock back, uh, rotate back and forth, it's almost nothing. That's the backlash across all the gears combined. So they're just really tightly machined. Always had a fondness for these. Always kind of like them better than the Milwaukee 1660s just because they just have this more smooth, elegant body and a more standardized uh, switch setup. One of my favorite half-inch drills I've had, and uh, that's why I always kept the DeWalt DW131 that I have, that factory reconditioned one. This is one of the best, and it's uh, kind of cool to run into these one of these 1321 Black & Deckers, just because they don't... Uh, Probably once a year I'll see a drill, I'll recognize this body style, and maybe, I mean, it's probably every three to five years that I actually run into one of the heavier duty ones. As time goes on, less and less of these turn up. People were excited about them, get them, and so a new generation holds on to them for years and decades. And of course, there's an ever dwindling supply of them as they get worn out and burned up, lost, you know thrown into oblivion by a tornado all the crazy things that happen power tools but that's the video about this one so whenever you see one of these drills even if it doesn't have the label it's super easy to figure out that it's the heavy duty one mainly just because you can see the distinctive cups of the needle bearings and when they're all ball needle bearing even with the triple reduction you can grab the truck and it should just rotate pretty smoothly when these things have sleeve bearings they can be a lot of force but this, barely any force, and it spins it back up through the gear reduction. Just a beautiful drill with great ergonomics. And really, for most people, this is all the power they'll ever need. I mean, driving larger palming bits, hole saws, just basically all the stuff. Just a great tool with just a lot of gears and heavy-duty gearbox and a lot of aluminum to sink away heat. Great for mixing mortars and grouts cement thin set floor leveling compound uh you name it just a really nice go-to drill and uh, dewald i think in 2010 or so stopped making the dw131 um and so these drills of this scale coming from stanley black and decker uh, i don't think exist anymore that's just all there is to it Milwaukee still has the 1660. They still have their whole hog. Uh, the Walt has the DW124, the Timberwolf, the big right angle drill. 
Um, and that's probably about as close, but it's, you know, it just seems that, um, the, these spade handle, compact, heavy duty, half inch drills are just becoming less favorable. Probably a lot of it's safety stuff too, because people don't like dealing with the big old long handles. So they pull off the handles and then they're just using one of these drills just willy nilly like this. And man, once again, when one of these bits jams, it just locks up. It just locks up. And so there's just so much rotating mass that even though you may be able to stall it out if it's progressively got more and more resistance and you're able to compensate, but when bits just lock up, if you know, if that can't rotate, then the drill, the bo the body of the drill does. And it can do it with enough force, or even where I had my leg or foot on it, it can actually sweep your foot out from under you and stuff. So anyway, love these tools. Glad to have picked it up and shared this with you. Anyway, thanks for watching. Anyway, I'm going to watch Migration in 4K. Never was really into the Despicable Me, but uh, Illumination, one of the things they focus on their animations is really good kinematics. Just the, the motion and the physics and the way these things move and interact doesn't look like a computer animation it looks like it's all the characters are what's known as motion capture really that's what makes their productions enjoyable is that they just have really good animation as far as the physics and how natural the movement is